right, we're going to be in the book of Genesis again this week. Genesis chapter 13. If you can find there, it's the first book of the Bible, so it should be easy. Unless you just have the New Testament, then you're just going to have to look on someone near you or uh, uh, swap Bibles. All right, swap Bibles. If they're not sure where Genesis is, you may win the battle. Okay, but Genesis chapter 13. There was a young boy that was going to see his grandfather, and he was traveling by train. This was many years ago. He took a seat beside a man who happened to be a seminary professor, and the boy was reading a Sunday school take-home paper. Uh, the professor noticed that, so he thought he'd have a little fun with the young boy. And he looked at the boy, and he said, Young man, if you can tell me something that God can do, I'll give you a big, shiny apple. But thoughtfully, the boy looked, and he was looking at his paper, then he looked up at that professor and he said, Mister, if you can tell me something that God can't do, I'll give you a barrel. All right. And, well, I guess he learned something in Sunday school. And we've been talking about prayer. And, that, and this is what's amazing to me about prayer. It's the ability to go to somebody that can do anything. Nothing. We sing the song, nothing is impossible uh, with God. Nothing. And we're, we're talking about prayer. So we've been looking. Last week, we looked at uh, Genesis 4 and verse 26. You don't have to turn there. I'll review because uh, this was last Sunday morning. Uh, this was talking about Seth, the son of Seth. There was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And so we're going to be looking at Genesis 13 because I, I mentioned that we're going to be looking uh, rather than uh, at just the topic of prayer, we're going to be looking at prayers of people in the Bible. So we're going to be looking specifically at the man Abraham this morning and looking at uh, one specific, we're going to look at a couple of the prayers that he did, but then we're going to settle on one, one person's assessment of prayer of when it is time to pray they said have you ever ever wondered when you know that it's time to pray one uh as, as i said this person was thinking about it and they said our stomachs growl when it's time to eat our eyes start closing when it's time to sleep or on sunday morning when our sorrow strikes and we get hurt it's time for tears when a new baby enters this world, it's time for gentle care. People will often tell us quite so when it's time to come or stay or go, but how do you know when it's time to pray? Does an alarm go off next to your bed? Or is there a clanging inside your head? When is it time to pray? This person answered, for me, at the beginning and end of each day. When I'm sick, feeling bad or scared or lonely or lost or sad when the bills blow in like sand i seek the touch of the master's hand when i need patience hope and peace and an abiding love that will not cease when i am thankful for all there is that is mine and yet is his that's whenever my heart has something to say that is how i know it's time to pray let's open in prayer heavenly father we would ask as we bow before you and we come to scripture and we ask that you would guide us through scripture you would give us clarity holy spirit you would do that which i can't and that is speak to hearts and we ask and claim your power lord in jesus name amen so we're looking at a couple of uh, prayers first and then we'll settle in on Genesis 13 so uh, Abraham there's actually a couple times that he cried out to the Lord one is a prayer of a desperate father you find that in Genesis 17 in Genesis uh, 17 this is when uh, God appeared to Abraham this is found in verses 1 through 4 when Abraham was 90 years old and 9 the Lord appeared to Abraham and said I am the Almighty God walk before me be thou perfect I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly and look at verse 3 it says and Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him as for me, God said, Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. 
And that's, uh, we see Abraham uh, getting a covenant established and God was promising that a son, Isaac, would be born. If you know the story of Abraham, Abraham and uh, his wife Sarah, they kind of connived together and uh, they went into Egypt, and we're going to actually be talking about uh, that prayer that's found in Abr uh, in Genesis. Sorry, Genesis 13, not Abraham 13, but it's found in Genesis 13. But uh, you see that one of the things that, that that happened down in Egypt, they got a maid to help them in life, and that maid's name was Hagar. And in verse 18, we see Abraham as a father of chapter 17 calling out for his son through that relationship with Hagar. In verse 18, it says, And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. Thou shalt call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Notice, God sidesteps his prayer. He's calling out in a prayer as a father, a desperate father for his son Ishmael. But God doesn't address that right away. But then look at verse 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. So we see prayer of a desperate father. If you go to uh, Proverbs, I mean, man, I'm having issues today with my books. Uh, Genesis 18, Genesis 18 and verse 16. This is another prayer that Abraham raises up to God. And the men rose up from thence to look toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I shall do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And we see a prayer. And basically, this is a, um, we saw a prayer of a desperate father. This is a prayer of a God-fearing uncle. Here is Uncle Abraham, and he knows that Lot, his nephew, is there in this wicked city called Sodom. And he pleads the case and says, won't you just spare the city because there is a righteous man named Lot? And eventually, he gets God to send angels to rescue his nephew Lot. You see that there's a man that believed in prayer. But let's go to chapter 13, and that's where we're going to settle in and learn this morning from Scripture, hopefully. And we're going to uh, consider the prayer for needed restoration. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 13. This is Abraham talking about his life. And Abraham, in verse 1, went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot went with him into the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. Notice in verse 4, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Here Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. The place Bethel he goes back to, you're going to see uh, in earlier in Abram's life, this place called Bethel, he had established it. When he came out of the land of Ur, he stopped in a place called Bethel and he set up an altar. He set up an altar, and that's where we're going to get the context. So we have to go to uh, chapter 12 to get the context of why he's returning to this place called Bethel. Look at chapter 12 and verses 1 through 8. Verses 1 through 8, the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. So here we see uh, God calls out 
This is a call to come out in chapter 12 and verses 1 through 8. Abraham answered the call. We know this passage is explained to us a little further in the book of Hebrews. If you want to mark it down, you can. But in the book of Hebrews, we read about Abraham and this specific story in Genesis chapter 12. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. It says, by faith... Abraham, when he was called to go out into, into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. The verse continues or in chapter 8, 11 and verse 9. It says, By faith he soldiered in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So let's consider this. This was a call out, a call to come out for Abraham. In chapter 12 and verses 1 through 8, God comes and says, Hey, you're living in this land of Ur. I want to make you a special nation. Come out. This is, I'm going to bring you into a strange land, and I will show you. According to Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham had no idea where he was going. Now, some of you sitting here, you may be married, and you're like, Whoa, he met my spouse. No, all right, I didn't meet your spouse. All right, but Abraham didn't know where he was going. But he had to move by faith. So Abraham, we believe, God was establishing something for us as believers. Believers, we walk by faith and not by sight. That is told to us by uh, Paul in his epistles. We walk in a different setting. As a Christian, we're talking about prayer. Prayer is an act of faith. Why? Because somebody that is unsaved is going to tell you, well, who are you praying to? God. Where is he at? Well, heaven, but actually he's everywhere. Oh, come on. I mean, you're praying to someone that's everywhere. So how do you know he's everywhere? Well, have you ever seen him? No. It's hard to explain it sometimes, isn't it? It's hard to explain about God, but this is what I know. By faith, God is asking me to take some steps. He's asking me sometimes to uh, stretch myself and to maybe do something that maybe I don't understand all the way, but God says, hey, I want you to take this step. Abraham is teaching you and I a lesson in faith, and that is sometimes God calls us to come out to be a part. That's what Abraham is called to do, so he steps out. We read, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham was unsure of where he is going. But then we go, we're there in Genesis chapter 12. Notice in verse 6, And Abraham passed through the land and, and the place of Sychem unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was in the land. Notice in verse 8, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and called called upon the name of the Lord. Look at there it is again. That's found in verse 4 in chapter 13. And there Abraham called in the name of the Lord. So this morning what we're going to dwell on a little bit is what happened in between verse 8 and verse 4 of chapter 13. So he comes out he sets up Bethel, which Bethel means, if, in the Hebrew, Bethel is the house of God. He establishes worship. He's communing with God. But something happened, and that's what we're going to kind of look at, and this will affect your prayer life. Notice what happens in verse 10. And there was a, what's the word? Famine. You guys are so awake. You know what? You could be sitting outside. We could be having church outside in the pouring rain, just so you know that right now. And we aren't, all right? So just think about that rain. And I know rain has that soothing. You know, some people, you may have it. You have your little radio that has um, soothing sounds, and one of them is like a thunderstorm. <sighs> All right, and so some of you, this is bedtime for you, all right? Try to push that out, all right? Here it says, and there was a what? Famine in the land. 
I want to dwell on that a little bit. Think about it. Because we see the call to come out in chapter 12 and verses 1 through 8. But in chapter 10, we see the choice. Notice in verse 10, and there was a famine in the land, and Abram, notice, I don't think it's by chance, and Abram went down. Oh, I love the Bible. The Bible is picturesque to me. You know what Egypt is a picture of in the Bible? The flesh. It's a picture of the flesh. You know what you will always find? You always got to go down to get away from God. You always do. And here you see that Abram went down. And it hurt his prayer life. He went down into Egypt. You got to be careful of the lure of Egypt. Because guess what happened? A famine came in. And, and, and through this, you're going to see, we're even going to talk about it uh, just a little bit at the end. You're going to find, because a lot of times, even at the beginning of chapter 13, notice what it says in verse 2. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. Some people look at that and say, man, Egypt did them good. But you'll notice right away in chapter 13, later in chapter 13, you know what those riches caused? Strife. Strife. All of a sudden, his nephew and Abraham, they couldn't even live together anymore. And you say, wow, that is, that's unbelievable. And what you'll find is sometime the lure of Egypt will promise you riches, but it's going to cause you strife. And later on, I think Abraham, that's why he was pleading. He was pleading in, in, in Genesis chapter 18 for his nephew Lot. Why? Because he knew he went down to Egypt and he had a lot of riches. And maybe that's the reason that Lot said, hey, I'm going to pick Sodom because he saw his uncle Abraham at one time choose Egypt. There's responsibility in your choices, folks. There's responsibility when you make a decision. And here in the Bible, you always see this. What was Israel delivered from? Egypt. What was Israel put under bondage? Where were they put in bondage? In Egypt. Egypt is a picture of the flesh, of the world, of that struggle. And what you find in verse 10, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt. This is what I warn you of. Be careful of decisions in time of famine. Be careful of decisions in time of famine. You know, and I think the timing of the famine is interesting. What was the timing? After Abraham moved out for the Lord. Made a huge decision. You know what, biblically, and I think all of us that have been saved for a little bit of time, you know this, when you have a huge victory, oh, uh, yeah, Woo. watch out. Devil's going to strike hard. He is going to strike hard. Remember, remember the story of Elijah? Elijah's on top of the mountain, prophets of Baal, he slices and dices. Man, fire comes down, consumes the altar, and then all of a sudden, he runs down. He beats chariots with horses. Now, that's a guy that I don't know what, what kind of, what kind of um, protein bar he ate, but, man, it fired him up. Turbo boost. Man, he's beating the chariots with horses down there. And then Queen Jezebel. I'm going to kill you. And guess what? <gasps> he takes off hiding. You know what? On the mountaintop, man, you're filling your Wheaties. Be careful. Because the timing of the famine is interesting because it's after Abraham says, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. And he's singing, and all of a sudden, there's no, no food. Sarah's in the tent cupboards, which I don't know how they were. It's kind of different in a tent with your cabinets. All right, she's opening up the flaps, looking in, and she's like, Abraham! There's no food. And guess what? The timing of the famine 
is, I think, a teaching point for you guys and myself. And that is, sometimes we think that when I make a decision for God, God all of a sudden is going to open up the windows of heaven. And you know what? I understand that. I preach that. I've studied that passage. I believe God will bless your life. But also, read the story of Job. And every once in a while, you're doing what's right. And every, I mean, you've made good decisions, and it doesn't go well. A time of famine comes. The timing of the famine is interesting to me. It's after a time of God's blessing that sometimes we tend to relax. We let our guard down, and the devil comes in. Be careful in those times. The Bible instructs us to be sober and to be vigilant all the time. So the timing of the famine is interesting. But then I think the other thing is there's a testing in the famine. Now, what do I mean by that? Testing during a time of famine is there to develop. It's an opportunity to develop your faith. Because guess what we find here? I think that we find that Abraham, he, he made some choices here. What did he make the choices? I think he let circumstances and self-preservation decide where he was going to go. Biblically, what do we find? Egypt is always a picture of what? The flesh and the world. So I don't believe biblically, as I look at the Bible and study it, I don't believe biblically that Abraham had a right to go down into Egypt, even though there was a famine, even though it was sparse. But circumstances said, wait a minute, Egypt, it seems like there's food there. Let's go. Or maybe it's just selfishness. It's self-preservation. There's food in Egypt. I'm going there. What should I do? When it gets tough in your life, and it's a time of famine, don't leave Bethel. That's what I'm telling you. Don't leave the house of God. And that's what some people do. It gets hard. It gets tough sometimes. And we say, you know what? I guess this ain't the place for me. I guess I'm going to quit on God. Look at over there. There's food. All right, so is the physical everything to you? No, it's not. We need to be careful of decisions in time of famine. We be, need to be careful of human wisdom and reasoning. And notice what takes over the spirit of Abraham. You'll see it in the verbiage here. Look, at there was a famine in the land. Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. Look at what it says. For the famine was grievous. You know, sometimes you're going to have that in your life. You're going to have a grievous time, hard time. So look at verse 11. It came to pass when he was come near into Egypt that he said unto Sarah, All right, here's a, a fair woman to look upon. That's his wife. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see that they shall say, This is his wife. They will kill me. They will save thee alive. Say, I pray that thou art my sister. So what happens here? All right, if you read this story, what made Abraham make that decision? When you go down into Egypt during time of famine, it's going to change your spirit, and you're going to have a spirit of fear. Do you notice the spirit? Is it confidence? No, he's like, oh, they're going to take you, honey. All right, then, not just a spirit of fear, then it's a spirit of dishonesty and deception. So, is it okay for Abraham to lie here? Now, notice, then it's not just a spirit of fear and selfishness, it's deceitfulness, and then, guess what he does? It's a spirit that causes hurt on others. Did you notice in the passage what happened? What happened to the Pharaoh? He was plagued. Why was he plagued? Did the Pharaoh know what he was doing? No. But Abraham, the man of faith, lied and deceived 
and was deceptive. Do you know that your actions can affect other people? Do you know that the Pharaoh was plagued not because of something he did necessarily, but because of Abraham? You need to be careful in the time of famine. And in my heart, this is what happens sometimes. I'm the same as you. When it gets tough, you know what starts whispering? I don't know. I mean, does God really know I'm here? I mean, he's, I mean, look at all these guys. They, I mean, they're experienced, they're experienced all kinds of things. They're getting new cars. I mean, they never have a bill ever that's late. They got all the money in the world. Be careful. Because it's everything basically in this physical world. Is that, how you, is that how you judge everything? Because now I never have a bill or maybe I'm not, uh, you know, I sometimes have to get on my knees and I've got to beg and plead and say, God, you know what, we need, some, we need something here. You're saying God's not there because I've got to get on my knees and beg him and pray and say, God, and I'm burdened? No, I don't. I think, I think God requires that sometimes. You, don't, you will never find in the Bible, you will never find in the Bible that basically your savings account will always be full. I have not, I have yet. I, believe me, I have searched that. I have searched for the little the little um, recipe that says if you give X amount of dollars to the church, you will have X amount of dollars in your bank account. I'd love to be able to say that. But guess what? God sometimes has you give, and right as you give, I mean, you're writing the check. As you're writing the check, there's something about it. It's like the, um, the, the demon, uh, the, the mechanic demon. That's what he is. He is inside your he is inside the hood of your car right then while you're writing the check, and he's like, phew, 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 throwing things, pulling wires, all kinds of stuff. Because as soon as you drop it in, all of a sudden, the next day that you take the car in, and they say, oh, yeah, you know what? It's going to cost you, and the amount you wrote the check for is what it's going to cost you. To, and you say, where are you at, God? You know what? In time of famine, be careful. Be careful. God's still God. Amen. He's still real. And it's an opportunity to develop your faith, and it's an opp opportunity to display God's glory. Do you know God can get glory in time of famine? He can. He can get glory during then. There's no Egypt in our life that is worth us forsaking our life of faith down here. Did you notice in the passage here, there was a famine in the land. Abraham went down into Egypt. I mentioned a couple of things. In Egypt, he came out, remember in chapter 13 and verse 2, he came out rich, but those riches caused a lot of strife in his family. Be careful of how you're weighing some of these blessings. Also, it was in Egypt that he got a maid called Hagar. You'll see it, read it. It is an Egyptian maid, and because Abraham already had to develop, and remember in this passage, it was a spirit of deception and dishonesty, lying to the Pharaoh, Guess what? I think that transferred to his wife. And they had been praying and praying, and God had promised a son. And God, God must not have heard him. It's a time of famine. And so now Sarah, his wife, says, hey, we have an Egyptian maiden named Hagar. Maybe that's how you're supposed to get a son. And they had a son, Ishmael. But that was not God's promise. Be careful. You see, Egypt, you may say, the lure of Egypt. Hey, look at they got food down there. Don't go down into Egypt. Notice in chapter 13 and verse 1, and he went up. 
out of Egypt. You'll see that verbiage many times uh, in the Bible. I think it's picturesque and I think it's on purpose because you go down to Egypt and the only way to get out is to look up, to get out. Get out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. He went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel and they came back. Notice what it says. He came back where his tent had been at the beginning. So let me close with a couple of thoughts. We said that there's a call to come out. There was the choice to head down. But how do you come back to the right place? A place of prayer. And notice he's calling out, and that's in chapter 13 and verse 4. And Abraham called on the name of the Lord. You notice what you'll find in Egypt? You will never see that phrase, that he called on the name of the Lord. Because in Egypt, you don't want to get on your knees. In Egypt, you don't feel like doing anything with God anymore. Because Egypt takes the desire away from you. It's all about the flesh. It's all about self-satisfaction. But at some point, we need to come up out of Egypt. And we can get back to the place that we're calling upon the name of the Lord. Abraham left Egypt thinking properly of himself and thinking highly of God again. And this humble frame of mind is disclosed in the route he chose because he chose to go back to the beginning. So let me give you a couple of thoughts. He went up. How do you come back to the right place? Start by heading back in the right direction. Start. You'd say, well, that seems really simple. It is simple to get saved. But I'm not going to say it's easy. We call it the simple plan of salvation because simply I have to humble myself and say that I have no part in it. That's the hard part. Because I want to be able to say that I earned my way. I deserve this. No, I don't. And neither do you. If you're unsaved here this morning, God's simple plan of salvation is, is still the same, and that is that Jesus paid it all. Jesus sacrificed himself, and you can't on your own, in your own merit, get to heaven. And so guess what I have to do? I go up. I start by heading back in the right direction. Notice, secondly, in the passage, he went back to the beginning. You know, the Bible says that in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 2, the Bible says this in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. What does he say? Go back to the beginning... I'm heading back in the right directions. All right, I went up, I go back to the beginning. I'm remembering my first love. I'm going back. I'm trying to remember that which brought me to righteousness. And you know what brought me to righteousness? Christ, Jesus. He's first and foremost in my life. And when I go to Egypt, I'm pushing him away. I'm thinking about my flesh again. And what good has your flesh done? Most of us sitting here, we know what our flesh does for us. It takes us away from God. It leads us down to a dark path, a lonely path. And it leaves us there. And it's as though the devil sits there after we have fallen into that trap and he laughs at us. As we sit in our own sorrow and remorse and we say, what have I done? And you can hear him snicker as you're following the devil's path. He went up. He started heading back in the right direction. He went back to the beginning. He remembered his first love. And he got to the altar. Altars were a place of worship, of humbleness, and of sacrifice. An altar, you know, we call it an altar of invitation. Some people are like, hey, so what, what does that mean? An altar of invitation. 
An altar in the Old Testament, many times they had actually animal sacrifices that they would do. But in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 12, it tells us that I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice. And it indicates to us that we present to God at an altar a living sacrifice. So does that mean, no, it's saying living. So it's alive. Amen. So you know what it's saying? This temple, this body is his. That's what it's saying. And I get back to the place that I have that altar. And in my home, you know what that means? And also, I have, I have an altar at church, but I have a family altar. You know what family altar is? Remember what altar represents worship. Do you have a family time of worship? You should. You should have a personal time of worship. That's a time with you and God. And then there should be a family time of worship that we come around. Why? Because in, in, in your home, in your home you want it to be that God is first and foremost. I don't want them, I don't want my children to think that, well, at church that's something there. I want them to understand that Egypt is bad all the time. All the time it's bad. Egypt is no place to have in our house. That idea of Egypt going down to Egypt. And so we don't want to have a house filled with flesh. And that's what, remember Abraham? Abraham, I, I, I love the story of Abraham because Abraham, it's, this is what the, the Bible is a transparent book. You know what that means? It means that the Bible doesn't hide things from you and say, Abraham, and we just revere. You know what I see with Abraham? I see flaws. You know what you're going to find with Christians here? Some people, you know, come to church like Fairhaven. A bunch of sinners. Okay. I'm not going to deny that because guess what I am? I'm a sinner. But so are you saying that you're not? Oh, righteous one. <laughs> no, because you're a sinner too. But the problem comes is when a church, really, it's when we don't deal with sin. That's when it's bad. You know what? As sinners here, the problem is when we like that sin and we dwell in that sin and we don't want to change what I like about Abraham, the story of Abraham, is he started out and he built that altar at Bethel. He got away, he went down into Egypt. But chapter 13's there. He came out. He came up. And guess what? The sad thing for some of us is we go down to Egypt and we die there. No way. No, make it be that even though a just man falleth seven times, but is that where it starts? It stops? No. What makes a just man? But he riseth up again. And as Christians here, you know what will make you different? Is when you understand like the example of Abraham. Abraham started out with a good prayer life and an altar and a worship, but time of famine came and he made a bad decision. But he didn't let that stop him. He came up and notice in the, our last remedy here is found in chapter 13 and verse 4. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. You know what you'll find? You can't do it. But you can call on the name of the Lord, and he is always there. I read a story, and I thought this was interesting. There was a, a CPA. Uh, if you have met CPAs, CPAs have their own world of thinking. Okay? CPAs are, are very methodical can sometimes irritate you. 
But a certified public accountant, this is what he did. He did something that maybe all of us should do. He decided to open a journal with God. He wanted to write everything that God gave him and everything he gave to God. He started keeping a debit and a credit book with God. If someone did him a favor, he put it down as God's gift to him. He credited, and then he started understanding, he credited God with the son, with his food, his health, his friends. And all of a sudden, he started listing out on the credit side thousands of credits. Finally, he gave up. And he said, it's impossible for me to balance the books. I find indeed that God my, is, is indeed my creditor, and what I have done for him is next to nothing. Amen. You know what you'll find? When you come to God, he's merciful. That's what you find with Abraham. Abraham came up out of Egypt, came back to Bethel, and he's back calling upon the name of the Lord. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 11, what is Abraham listed? He's listed as a man of faith that we can follow. Why? Was he perfect? No. Nope. But he learned that when God told him something to do, he prayed, he built that Bethel, that house of God, and he worshiped there. The time of famine came, he went away, but he realized, no, 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 no. I've got to come up out of Egypt and get back to Bethel. Could be that this morning God dealt with you because you had a Bethel, a place of worship, but you shut it down. Maybe it was a time of famine. Maybe it was a time of struggle. And you, like Abraham, said, wait a minute, circumstances are telling me that I need to go back to Egypt. My self-preservation kicked in and I need to get back to Egypt. No, you don't. Egypt will never benefit you. But what you'll find is coming back to Bethel, you can call again on the name of the Lord and he will hear you.